Welcome to Talking Baseball. We have a very special guest today, Trevor Ploof's childhood friend, Delman Young. Welcome to Talking Baseball. My name is John Boy. I got Trevor Ploof. I got Jake. We got producer BBD, and we got a special guest coming up on today's interview, the Friday episode. Thank you to everyone who has been listening and uh, being part of this quarantine ride with us. Pretty impressive the amount of guests we've had. I'll say it myself for ourselves. Two interviews a week with a middle episode. It's quite the fun task. So thank you everyone for allowing us to do this. Jake, how are you doing on this fine? Well, it doesn't matter. This is going to get released on Friday. We're recording on Wednesday. How are you doing? Doing, doing well, James. Um, I two announcements. I'm off steroids. Um, for my back. Second announcement. I'm back on steroids. Okay, I was going to say. <laughs> so uh, that's that's good. I'm uh, on the juice, off the juice, on the juice, and uh, yeah, man. Uh, Delman Young. I, I was excited for this because this. Uh, this brings out some of Trevor's roots too. It it does, and well, the reason I wanted to bring him on not only is like he's just he's yeah he's definitely part of my baseball story, but I think he just gets a bad rep. Like he's been in some stuff, like some confrontations uh, that the, the media painted in a certain way. But I I I know those weren't his true colors. Like everyone that's played with him loves Delman Young, so it's nice to like have him on here and, and have him talk about those situations and, so, and sort of like clear the air on them. And I think um, as you listen to him, you'll understand like the he's umpire just a fun loving guy. The umpire, and I won't, I won't spoil it because we talk about when he threw his bat at the umpire and it's just a funny story. And then the other thing is uh, he talks about, um, well, you know what, let's go to the interview and then we can recap a tiny bit afterwards. Here we go, Delman Young. All right, we have the special treat. Normally, we have one Lehigh Valley Iron Pig, but we have two today. Delman Young <laughs> joins the program. Delman, how you doing, man? Good, good. How you guys all doing? We're surviving. All right, man. Yeah, yeah. Day day by day. I guess I guess people know you from a couple other teams: Twins, Tigers, Rays, all over. Um, but yeah, man, Trevor's been stoked about this. He says. He, he says you guys have had a lot of good times back in the day. Yeah, well, uh, you know, first semester ever, I, I had just turned 12, and you were 11, and we are playing on the same travel ball team. That's uh, right. We used, to sleep over, we used to sleep over each other's houses because all of our parents were working and stuff, and then one of our parents would take us to the games or drive us back. And, you know, a lot of us uh, – uh, parents made a sacrifice for all of us to be able to play in all these games and everything. And eventually, uh, it worked out for me and Trevor and the rest, uh, the rest of the guys that worked out, uh, just not major league baseball, but they, they went to college, played, uh, now have families and, um, working and everything. But, uh, baseball, baseball has done a lot for me. Yes, it has. And it's funny because you mentioned like we used to play together on our travel teams and, when it, when I go back and think about those days, I mean, Delman was, he was a cheat code. Like in, in, in those days, you know, when he was 12 and, and, and further up past that, but especially in those days, I mean, when the other team saw that we had Delman Young and, and everyone knew his name and everyone knew what he could do on the field. I mean, the game was over, essentially. We would just wallop people because they were scared of Delman. And Delman would either, and he'd barely even pitched back then. But if we needed you to, we would just like throw Dell on the mound. And all of a sudden, he's like a 12-year-old, cl- nearly pumping 90 miles an hour, which, you know, I think at that time, I don't know about 90, but like <laughs> definitely like upper 70s, 80s, and then he obviously developed into that in high school. But yeah. uh, it, w- it was a lot of fun, man. I, I didn't hit 90 till the next year at 13. <laughs> 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 was there anyone else on this team? I mean, I mean, Delman's first-round pick. Uh, in 03 and then Ploof, your first round pick the next year. Um, is there anyone else? Who else was on this 12 year old team? What do you got, uh, Don? Big, big league guys, I think it might have just been us two, but there was a lot of guys that were in our area that were top guys. 
that went into went to college, and so I think some play pro ball, some didn't. But you know, it's, it's hard going from twelve and then to keep developing and growing and being stronger. And then with all the, especially when you you play summer games when you're a little older against the Texas kids, and they've been in the weight room for football. <laughs> And you got the California kids who are just long and lanky, shaggy hair, and then you play against the Midwest kids, and they're coming out there two, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years old. You're like, what? What is this? But yeah, I'm trying to think if we had anybody else. Going. It's just hard to keep going, but I, I think it's just, uh, I think it's us two. Just so everyone went D1 though. Yeah, I'm not sure if Chris Valeka was ever played on that specific team. But uh, that whole Valeka, oh, yeah, the whole Valeka family, there's like 17 brothers. We all kind of grew up with them as well. And I think, what, now three three of them have been in the big leagues, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. I, I, and there's like three or, there's three or four of them I know that play baseball. Yeah. 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 And then the youngest one, the one that's playing now, I remember was like all the brothers always talked about was was better than all of them. Yeah, I love I love stuff like that, man. That was a good baseball family, and uh, they've done they've done really well with it, which is cool. Do you do you guys have any? Because I mean, that time period that's that's right around the time me and Jimmy kind of kind of linked up together. And I I think at that age you have I don't know some kind of dumb stuff sticks in your head, like you you have a movie you reference from that time, like. Uh, I, I don't know. You guys were doing sleepovers and stuff. Like, I've got a group of buddies. If I reference a Saving Silverman quote, like, they know it like that. But it was, like, a dumb movie from that time period that we just beat into our brains. Do you guys have any references like that? If you say something, you jump back to being 12, 13 years old? it has got to be, like, uh, an assistant coach on that team. Some, some uh, like... I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was anything like that. I think how most teams are in baseball players, especially baseball players. I think that's usually just a, a player or the way maybe when your teammates talks or walks or, you know, <laughs> does that, you know, or someone's, you know, favorite, you know, ad lib that they always have to say, like, that might be something. I, I got, I I got one. one. Do you, we had this coach who was – it was basically Hank Steinbrenner for 12-year-old travel ball. Oh, my. Ronnie, his name was Ronnie Michaels. Or I think it was Ron. And was his son Ronnie? Yeah, yeah, yes. Ron, so, it was so, Ron and Ronnie. Yeah, so Ron, big Ron. He, um, he was the Steinbrenner. He would, he's the one that got Delman and I on this team. He already had this team that needed better players. And basically he kind of like recruited us onto this team. And he was a guy who was like, he didn't coach, but he was always in the dugout. And if you needed something, if somebody needed to fly out, if you needed a hotel room, help with the hotel room, which a lot of us did, you know, travel ball is not cheap. Uh, this guy was there to take care of it. And he just wanted to be a part of this thing, man. And he was like one of those guys, larger than life personality, always at the games. Like he had his like big, uh, I remember this to the day I died. A Carl's Jr. cup would have some like spiked iced tea in it. And he would just be living the dream, man. Like kind of like pulling the pulling the strings, like you know, living his strings, living I his think. dream. Living, living his, his dream. dream living dude. his dream. <laughs> big big Ron. He was someone I'll never forget. Now, he passed away not too long yeah. ago, but um I'll never forget. Yeah, that, that was uh and and also too, it was like a, a Steinbrenner. It wasn't uh, like looking for, I need this, I need that. When you go to, because I remember I was with the Thousand Oaks team, you got to pay a lot of money each month, and it was like, it was expensive. And then we played a tournament with the Phil Kyle Angels in it. Ron comes up to my dad after, I'm like, you know, would you like for him to join this, basically Southern California all-star team of uh, travel ball players? We do this, we do this, we play in these terms, we go here. Uh, we provide all this, and it was like, all right, yeah, you get to practice and play with a uh, uh, really strong team, and it's not coming so much out of your pocket to be able to play baseball. Yeah, that was a big thing. We needed that. I mean, at that time, like I said, you know, money wasn't – money was uh, tough to come by, and you got this guy like, hey, I got this team. 
you want to come play? I'm going to help take care of a lot of the expenses. We're like, yes, sir. Let's do it, baby. And that's how a lot of us got together. Yeah. How about that? That's crazy. I mean, we'll jump, jump forward a, a ton of years and we'll, we'll get back to the beginning of your career, Delman. But when Plouffe makes his debut, the guy hitting in front of him is you. If, I, if my research is correct, that's kind of a crazy full circle. Would you get a kick out of that? Like, you know, because you had been in the league for three years. Um, and when, do you remember Ploof making his debut? Uh, was he nervous? Yeah. Do you rem- I wasn't so nervous because I, I've been around him so long that he, you know, you can kind of see, hear him talk and everything and knew that, like, was nervous, but he was poised and ready to, he's been looking forward to that day for so long and working so hard. Like, he knew he was nervous, but you're just going to try to let him just enjoy the moment and get everything out the way, get the, the nervousness, get the first hit, everything out the way. So it was fun, but also, too, I got traded over to Minnesota after the 07 season, and me and Trevor were roommates ever since for spring training. So uh, okay. with be, being with them in spring training and playing with them in spring training, uh, it almost just felt like I was always with them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not, not like that. Not like that. <laughs> no, no. We, we, we always had a good time. You know, uh, Delman was like, like a big brother and he was so good at like understanding the big league lifestyle. Um, so he would take care of me, man. It was like, he had the place in spring training. I'd go live with him. Uh, we'd share a car. And then one year he was like, I'm not sharing a car with you. He got me my own rental car. <laughs> so, um, like, you no, know, like, I mean, I think I know this answer, but what, like, I've, I always felt like you were just so good at like handling the, the, the lifestyle. Like where did, where did that come from? Well, uh, I had Dimitri in front of me. So, uh, and there was an age difference, 12 years between me and my brother. So, you know, that's the only reason I ever played baseball, you know, watching him play, you know, and then going to in the summer when you get vacation, you know, following him around in the minor leagues, following him around the big leagues and everything, and seeing how the older guys, when my brother was younger, taught him. And then he was teaching me. And then when I got to the big leagues, you know, they were called Crawford and Rocco Baldelli. And then over – so – so then I had my own experience with the uh, older guys, how they were doing things, and then going to Minnesota with uh, Justin Morneau, Nara, Kadir, Joe Nathan. You know, you can name a, a, a lot of guys. And so I always kind of been around the game for so long. And I got called up uh, at 20, so I just been around it my whole life. And just seeing things and then uh, just knowing that you know, winning teams and stuff like that. You know, most guys, you got to gotta get along and, you know, have fun when you're at the field. Yeah, Delman's not going to talk about it too much, but, like, I'm, tell, I'm talking, like, he's the guy who would approach you about buying you a suit. If you're a young guy, like, Delman bought me suits. And the only thing he ever asked in return was that I did the same thing when I became a veteran. And, like, it's stuff like that that gets passed on from guy to guy. And, like, you talk to a lot of guys in the game now, and it doesn't happen as much. And it's kind of a shame. I, I understand the, the, the dress codes are getting more and more lax, so it's kind of like you don't need it. But um, it's, it, was a, it was a cool experience to be able to have him be, like, that kind of mentor for me. But, like, also, like, I'd known him forever. So it was, like, this really special dynamic that we had together. And, um, I mean, people – People love Delman. Anybody that's ever played with, with him, like you ask anybody and like they're like Delman's one of the best teammates I've ever had. Does he got more juice than you? Because we saw your juice around spring training and you're a well liked guy. He's got you beat. Pro- yeah, probably. About this yeah, I would say so. Damn. You know, he's been right, we're even pool and we're even pool power. We're even pool power. <laughs> okay. okay. You you got that like postseason magic though, man. So a lot of guys, you know, you made a lot of guys some money in the postseason. Well, the uh, my natural swing is to uh, loft it to right field, and luckily we're at Yankee Stadium for a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. 
Yeah, well, what about your, your path from – I mean, you blew through the minor leagues. It was like two and a half to three seasons, really. You get called up at 20. But also you're, you're with the Rays, the expansion team. And I, were you their first draft pick overall? Is that, is that correct? No, 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 no. Oh, no, wow, no. No. They were they, – They were drafted on a while. Maybe 96. They're, yeah, I, think I had that way, out, way wrong. <laughs> they were two years before they – had the expansion because the expansion draft and everything. No, uh, I was an 03 draft and got called up in 06. When you get drafted by the Rays, being a California kid, or, or and they're like a new team, I mean, first overall is pretty damn exciting. But was there any, like, did you not understand, like, you know, what was the, what were the Rays all about then? Because, I, I mean, I, I was too young to remember. But was it an exciting franchise to go to? Was spring training kind of new and different? I mean, they were, because they started no, uh, with a bunch of aging vets. And then the young crew started coming but, up with you guys and Crawford and all that. It went, by the time I was drafted, it was kind of how you kind of started seeing – what's the team recently? Like the Cubs. When they had some older players and then the younger players started coming up. And then it's because they still have a really young team. That's how it was kind of for us. We had an older team earlier, then it got younger. And then Lou Pinella had Rocco Baldelli and Carl Crawford playing every day in the big leagues, 20, 21 years old, 22. And so starting to transition, and then Joe Madden came in. And then that's when Joe Madden and Andrew Friedman, when they came in, then Tampa start taking off. Yeah. You get and then you get called up. You're 20, and I was like going through the whole your first that bat and all that, and it's a it's a first pitch hit by pitch. Uh yeah, I got the 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 Freddie Garcia. Welcome to the big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all hey, any getting hit getting hit by a pitch in the big leagues is way better than doing anything in Triple A. <laughs> I, I didn't even care. <laughs> like, all right, whatever. Uh, get on base. This is going to be the only way I get on base. I don't walk, so uh, I was just happy to get on base. You know, it was kind of it was kind of good because you know my back foot was I'm talking about wobbling in the batter's box. I was I was finally in the big leagues and I'm up there um, wobbling. If he threw me anything over the plate, I would have swung and missed. Probably fell down, but he hit me and it was able to calm my nerves. Do you think that had okay? Because we right before that happened, when you're in AAA, we, I told you we got to talk about this. We had the whole bat incident with the umpire. Yeah, and I want to. I want to get into that with you a little bit. But do you, do you think that was retribution? Like, was Freddie Garcia like pandering for like umpire approval when he hit you? Is that something uh, that you I, thought of at the time? I don't necessarily think it was oh my God. I think it was just uh at two thousand six all the things that happened in uh Durham, North Carolina, uh with that team. You know, I was a part of it with the the incident. Uh Elijah Dukes uh had his situation. Um, you know, there was a a lot of things going on and it was just uh, that's the old school baseball that's not really around anymore. Uh, which I which I got when I first got up. It was uh boom. Welcome to the big leagues, show some respect and you'd be good. And then that was it. And then what happened the next at bat? Uh, I started taking some gangster hacks trying to uh get some retribution and Freddie Garcia that was still when I start seeing what a, a real big league breaking ball looks like. Um, <laughs> they mean, you know, they come right in and the minor leagues, if they're up, they kind of stay up in the big leagues. That thing has so much spin on it. I swung over the top of them. I struck out. Uh, but then you try to come with the same sequence again. And, uh, my first hit was uh, a home run left field. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to fly and, uh, be really excited because I really was, but I try to act like a, you know, I was supposed to be here. I've done that before. <laughs> uh, it's no big deal. Even in my head, I'm like, dude, that's number one. 
dude, I hit up really hard. I've been practicing every day my whole life just to do this. And I finally did it. And so it's just it was just an uh, unreal experience. I'm just getting a phone call from Andrew Friedman, getting on the flight, going to my room, opening the door. I don't have a roommate. Uh, I was so happy in the room. <laughs> you know, five-star hotel. Uh, just the way, just to go to the field. You, go, you know, it's just, uh, I feel like rock stars going to the field every day. Yeah, it's a nice, it's nice. Do you, do you wish, like nowadays, it's the, the tide's, kind of changing on celebrations obviously and there's the whole let the kids play like do you do you wish you could have just been your joyous self or do you think there's something fun about you know or respectful about you know acting the ho-hum been there done that if you go back do you wish you could have been fist pumping and and bat flipping your first home run uh if it was a bomb i was gonna bat flip it anyway but it had a lot of topspin on it so i had to run (laughs) but uh I think uh, I like to let the kids play as long as it's not done um, out of spite or you know to show. Them, but you know, just guy takes his home around bat flips, does that, you know, just to his team and you know, get the fans up. You know, it, 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 I, I have no problem with it because one thing, you got a lot of people. Uh, I always say baseball is boring, stuff, but when you take them to a baseball game. If you took anyone that said baseball was born to their very first baseball game and it was that Blue Jay game, they would come out a baseball fan. So I think it it works in a lot of uh, a lot of ways where it makes the game exciting. Yeah, you're talking about the Bautista bat flip? That was a yeah. big one. I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's uh, the ESPN showing the KBO games now. And I think the crowds are normally insane. So that's kind of one of the weird things. Just, well, watching it without any fans, but but never mind missing that because they bat flip, they have fun. And and I, I, I think the game needs more of it and it's coming. It seems like pitchers are getting off their high horse about a little bit. Yeah, you know, because I don't mind if uh, I strike out in a baseball situation. And, you know, you celebrating because you know, that, that's your job. I would have celebrate if I drove in the runs. Yeah. But, you know, let the let – the, let the hitter also do it because it's hard to hit. It's hard to hit 95. Well, the guys are throwing 100 now. It's hard to hit. It's hard to square up 100. It's so hard to hit the baseball. Let me enjoy when I, when I hit it because, you know, soccer, they sell everything, hockey, football, you know. Let all the sports celebrate when you, know, you do something good. Yeah. What Trev- um, and- in 2010, that that was kind of your your biggest year. You get, I mean, top 10 MVP. Um, you know, 298, 826 OPS, 21 homers, 112 driven in. Uh, I mean, was that a year that it just felt like it all came together? Were for you? Were you healthy? Did something happen with your swing, or was it just like, hey, this is this is what I do? He knew Ploof was coming up. His best friend from 12 years old. Yeah. Uh, you just. Uh, that year was kind of was different because uh, she, I have my Aprils are terrible, and so then you know you're you trying to make up from such a bad start uh, that you start like panicking, you start trying to make up all these things that you shouldn't even be worried about. You should be just worried about playing the game, pitch to pitch, the bats and that, and and then. Uh, worry about all the other aspects of baseball, but that year, uh, I got out to a hot, a hot start, so it was able to keep my numbers afloat while I was struggling. And then when I got going, I really got going, and uh, everything has worked worked out with that team we had. I had, I well, spend my time talking to Morneau, Mauer, Kadir, all the time, and then that year. I would spend my time with Jim Tome and Carl Pavano, the last group of BP in right field. And Carl will be talking about swing pass or about how he's going to pitch. He asked Tome about a guy swing pass, and they'll talk about 
what he probably can cover with his type of swing and stuff. And I'll just be sitting there and listening and tell me, I'll ask Tommy questions and he would tell what he learned and he would say stuff from what uh, Manny Ramirez taught him and Albert Bell and all those hitters of the 90s he played with. And then when he went to Chicago, Paul Kornucker. So I just had a lot of information and then I had uh, a lot of guys around me just said, always, if something's just kind of slightly off, to kind of get me back going. So my slumps were lower. They were they're only like a couple of weeks instead of like two months. So I, I was just fortunate enough to have a great team around me, great players, great coaches. And I ain't going to lie. That stadium, Target feels sick, and you can see really well there compared to at the Metrodome. Uh-huh. I didn't have Joe Maurer's vision to be able to see uh, as well as, as he could. He could he could hit blindfolded and, and stuff like that. But the Target feels it, it's a a great place to hit. The ball doesn't feel as hard because you can see really well. Yeah, I'm no. diving through the numbers here, and in July of that 2010 season, you had more multi-hit games than you did single or zero hits. You had a 434 batting Oof. average. Like that just is an insane month stretch. That had to feel pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, it, it was fun, and I'm glad I didn't have a stat cast out there for it. And <laughs> because yeah, I had good numbers, but I had some luck. I had, <laughs> you know. Some balls fall in. Uh, this was pre-shift, and so I can get balls to go up the middle. I can get balls to go in the five-six hole, and so I I might have had uh, four hundred on the average. And I, I hit some balls hard, but you know there there were some balls like coming off my bat at about sixty miles per hour with the first baseman's head. <laughs> they all count. <laughs> that counts, man. Yeah, I, yeah. That's why I'm glad that cap wasn't there. Do you do you think that was the best team you've played on? Because you played on some pretty good teams. But I mean, I I know the 2010 Twins team. I was terrified because you, the team was so good. I didn't want to fuck anything up when I went up there. Um, but then you go to Detroit and you play on those teams. Like, is yeah, what, what's the, the best the, team? That that Detroit team. Best the be, the 2012 Detroit team. Dude. Was the best. Thing I thought. Once we once we got into the playoffs and we start rolling, you know, we had Burlander, Scherzer, Fister, Forcello, Annabelle Sanchez, bullpen for days. Everyone throwing ninety five plus. Um, you had a triple crown winner for Prince. I mean, third uh, Prince at first. I forgot Prince. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, we you had we you just had so. so many years the two thousand eleven team that we we lost to Texas. Because I only say that those teams are the best teams I played on. It's because the starting pitching. You have two for sure guys that were on those Detroit teams and that rotation that are going to the Hall of Fame. Yep. And with those two guys and how well Fister, Priscilla, I don't know this all year, and all the things we had, I said, all right, we can beat San Francisco, but. Those guys just know how, they just know how to play some baseball. I, I got to give them that. They can play. Those are some great teams. I tell people that all the time about that Tigers team, just how stacked they were, and the pitching staff is definitely like why like they were so good. But then you just look at the hitters you have, and I mean, like you were saying, I mean, you got Prince, you got Miggy, you got you, um, Johnny Peralta, Alex Avila, Austin Jackson. Yeah, I was just I – I forget about Austin Jackson and how, how damn good he was that year. Yeah, and Andy so, Dirks uh, had a really good year that year. Andy Dirks, you know, yeah, I remember him. You had a pretty good postseason there too. I think you had a big home run in the elimination game in uh, the World Series to tie it in the bottom of the six. All your playoff numbers are pretty good. Did, uh, did the high-pressure situations like that, did you, did you eat them up or was it just the, the same as any other day? For some reason – Ever since playoff, any playoff game or big game, my whole life I've been using it well. But I had experience from the 08 postseason run 
of how the game is actually different at different points of the year. Like, almost since I was coming up in the minor leagues, you get to spring training, you're trying to make the team. And you're trying – while the big the big dogs, they're getting ready for the season. So, you know, the, the spring training, there's the beginning of the season. There's the dog days in the middle of the season. You know, it's that playoff push from the last two months of the year. And you can just see how guys, especially how the guys have really started getting in. As the season went on, the routines were better. And they were ready to go out there and win baseball games. And so that 08 season – uh, kind of prep me, and then we lost uh, game 163 uh, to the White Sox. Toman hits a home run, so it's one nothing. Great, great, great game. And then so the next year we ended up playing 163 and we win it. And so I kind of started seeing how everything was different. Then we get into the playoffs and we play the Yankees right away. I got I got to hit my last of that. We got swept, and I saw how they pitched differently in the playoffs than they did when we faced them through the year or any tapes that we watch. And we started learning about the advanced guys during the postseason race. In the last few months of the season, they're just following you around, getting every detail on you. And so you start seeing how – start understanding why guys struggle in the postseason and stuff like that. Plus, the teams are better. Yeah, so you, you think that you started to understand the game's different in the postseason, and then as you found that out, you were able to make adjustments. Because you are, I mean, you're like a, kind of like a postseason legend. I mean, you come up with some huge hits. I mean, obviously in Detroit, and then that huge swing against Detroit with the, with the Orioles. Was it against Soria? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The hanger up there, Soria. you came in and banged that one. So that's cool. To, that's, that's some good insight for, for – for, for people to listen to, like it is. I mean, you're saying the beginning of the season is different, middle of the season is different, end of the season is different, and the game is all about adjustments, and you were one that was able to really do that. And that's what I'm saying, man. People love you because you made them a lot of money in the postseason. Yeah, because I'll tell you the one, one thing about the postseason. Whenever the leadoff goal goes on, it doesn't matter how. The score is still tied. Doug, you should give a tie early. I remember just sitting out there, the leadoff guy gets on. Um, we're going to lose this game. We're gonna, <laughs> oh, my God, the leadoff runner is on. Oh, my God, we're going to lose one. Nothing. Like, every, like, the attention to detail is magnified so much. A little walk, a little moving guy over, everything counts in the playoffs. And so that's why I remember, some, you know, talking to Buck, talking to Daniel Rosari. That's why they, they preach the, the minor league coordinators and the coaches. And so player development guys, so you guys are know how to play baseball when they they come up there because little mistakes can ruin your whole season. Yeah, and I, I you you mentioned Buck there a little bit at the end, and I I think the those Baltimore teams, I mean they they had some talent on them. I know Jim Jim mentioned he wanted to ask you what what was what was going on with Young Machado, but we're also a sucker for Buck Showalter. They uh, we're we're Yankee fans, and he's starting to do stuff on the Yes Network now, and it's it's a comedy show because they Buck. I, I don't know your experience with him, but he's not your what you expect as a TV guy. The Yes Network put him on the middle of the screen, like in between two guys, and they were just like talking through him. But at the end of the day, he was spitting some awesome baseball knowledge. He was doing some rundown stuff that was really neat. He was talking about pitchers throwing the bases, and it was like, wow, this guy notices some nuances of the game that are like kind of mind blowing to us sitting here on the couch. So, so I don't know if that's if, if you've got any good Buck stories, because if you do, I, I would eat them up for days. Uh, yeah, I got a good book stories uh, just for, like, the knowledge and stuff. If you guys want real good book stories, you guys are going to get Adam Jones on the line. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Some good book stories. But, uh, yeah, Buck was – it was a – it's been the only time for any team I went to. In spring training, we – not every day, but every other day, seemed like we would have a quick meeting in the, the video film room um, and we'll talk about how we're going to – what's the best way, you know, to get uh, like a ball down the line, cut off and relay. We're in a shortstop and third base, man, and where they're going to be lining up at. You know, they have a, a whiteboard 
with uh, the diamond on it and then you know, just moving pieces around. And he's really great uh, going over all the small details that you really don't go over that much or you go over really quick. And so and then he has a video to show us. So it's almost like uh, I never played football. So uh, it's like a, a film room uh, session of how we're going to do things and how, how he wants things done, show us, we'll talk about it. And then we'll go out break and do our practice stuff. But he was, he's really uh, pays attention to every small detail of baseball. Your list of managers that you played for is a pretty impressive crew of like baseball hardened managers. You got garden hire Leland, Charlie Manuel, Buck Showalter, and then Joe Madden. Um, on the outside, it seems like Joe Madden is much different than those other four. Actually playing for those guys, is there is there a big difference between any of them, all of them? Is there a style that you, you enjoyed the most? You know the thing about it is they're all very similar because they they are players' managers. And so they will defend the player – you know, they'll be the one to take the blame in the media. They'll be the one sticking up for everybody. So they're all, they all have their own things. They're all personal and everything. But Joe, he took it to another level with, <laughs> eh, no dress code, no thyself, be yourself. What's going to make you show up every day and be a good teammate and bust your butt with all the 25 guys here? Whatever you need to do, I don't care what it is, as long as it's legal. <laughs> so, uh, just going to make you, at, as soon as you show up to the ballpark, be good in the clubhouse and play the game hard. That's all that he said. I don't care what you do. If you want to surf all day before you get here and come, go do it. Just what's going to make you, what's going to bring the best out of you? That's how Joe is. Joe was on the so much. He wasn't, he's like a psychologist, like a, like kind of going to, uh, like uh, the, the really good one that passed away uh, about 10 something years ago, Harvey Dorfman, you know, a good baseball fight guy to talk to. Joe's really good at understanding uh, every individual on his team and not, and one guy to get him going, you might need to yell at the other guy. You might need to baby the other guy. You might just need to leave alone. The other guy might need to do this. Joe comes out. It's 25 man roster. His 40-man roster, and any player that was uh, that he's around, he finds out a way to get the best out of them. That's yeah, good. that's cool. I mean, that list is awesome. And like Jake said, I was just curious about when you when you get to Baltimore, you're you're standing next to 20-year-old Manny Machado, who's lighting the world on fire. I think he had MVP votes. But you yourself, you know, second in Rookie of the Year. You debuted as a 20 year old. Did you, uh, did you, was it fun to see another young kid or see him at that level? I mean, there's also like he was getting in trouble with some dumb things, it seemed like. What was it like to step in that clubhouse and, and greet 20 year old Manny Machado? Well, uh, we all know how the TV could be, the media could be. Just when you see something, you, you can make a big deal out of it depending on which player. Manny's awesome. Manny's a dog. Manny's a G. Whatever you want to say, Manny is awesome. Man, Manny, you want you want him on your team. Manny's fun because uh, when I was there, since I was the team, um, so I didn't play every day. You know, I play cards with Manny, Ryan Flaherty, Jonathan Scott, but uh, got some crews to be around. Adam Jones, you know, all the guys are always around, and then. Uh, on the road trips, we'll take Manny, Scope to dinner. Uh, Adam Jones will do that. And so we're – I always hung out with Manny at the field, off the field, uh, the hotel room. We'll play cards, uh, watch TV and stuff like that. I think we'll sit next to each other on the plane and stuff. But Manny's a good guy. Uh, he's got a bad rap in the media, which happens to a lot of people. But, you know, Manny's very good at dinner, you know. Uh, growing up in Miami, t- taking care of a lot of people and everything, you know, I love that kid. Uh, he's a man now, but he's still a kid to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear about that, about Manny, you know, because he does get painted in a negative light. And I feel that kind of 
coincides with like kind of some of the stuff that you dealt with as well. Like, you know, you mentioned, I, I totally forgot about that. <clears throat> there was like that USA Today article about you guys in Durham. And I think there was like a classic quote, like you had, like we're down uh, in the minor leagues and, and they're up there in the big leagues yeah. showering in Evian water. <laughs> yeah, that was, just, that was just, uh, it was Dukes. He was Dukes. Dukes is just very honest. And uh, he was just trying to just say that the big leagues is nicer than the playing in a triple A, which every yeah. baseball player knows that it's just <laughs> the analogy and for who said it, they just made it worse. And so it was uh, like, we shower in snow water, they shower in Avion, which, you know, it's not really true. But if you want to talk about the pay scale, that's kind of what it is. You know, like guys are in AAA trying to get to the big leagues to uh, provide for a family and everything. And you want to get to the big leagues and make more money and play the sport that you love and be able to support anyone that you have to support and be able to play the game that uh, for me, it's the most fun outside skateboarding. It's the most fun thing I ever done in my life. <laughs> Just made Trevor so happy. Uh, dude, because oh, no, I, Trevor knows. <laughs> I think about that all the time. Um, I remember young Delman with like bleach blonde hair, you know, uh, punk rocker, you know, like really like hardcore dude. Um, but I've seen you obviously the progression. Uh, as you get a little bit older, and I, I'm a, I was the same way. I was a punk guy, and then probably because of you, you and my brother. Uh, oh, it's where we grew up in California too. It's only hip hop and punk rock growing up. There's not nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, it's funny. I mean, I love that you brought up the skateboard. I think because people, I feel like people need to know Delman a little bit better because the some of the public perception is the bat tossing incident, and you know that article. But uh, to get, like, the background, I think, is really important. Yeah. If you're saying even yeah, with Manny we, Machado, he gets a bad rep, and he sh maybe he shouldn't because people just don't know the whole damn story. Yeah, it's like people think I'm from, like, the hard part of L.A., gangster, stuff like that. I'm like, bro, I grew up near Calabasas and Malibu, bro. I'm from the suburbs, huh? <laughs> Skateboard. Like, relax. <laughs> And I said, all, all we did in my hometown was play baseball and skateboard. That's all most uh, Cameroon kids did that that were doing active stuff. And then they start getting in the water, and, the water under snow. And then, you know, as you get older, you know, baseball fizzles out either by interest or by talent. And, but you can still go do all the other things. But, yeah, my area is. Straight extreme sports and baseball, baseball, football. Can can you take us through the? We're gonna have like our guys, uh, Kyle and the other editors, kind of clip this 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 um, incident. But can you take us through the bat in the Empire? It was in Pawtucket, right? Yeah. Can you kind of uh, take us through what happened? Because I think that's like, it's like a funny. Yeah. Story. So we'll 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 dial it back in the spring training. To before that, you know, it was 06, just come up minor league player of the year. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, he's going to compete for a spot in spring training. I'm like, all right, all right cool. That's all I've been trying to do forever. So we go down there, spring training, play spring training, and then pull you in the office. And then, hey, we just need you to go down there and make sure, you know, you just need a little season to get ready and stuff like that. You know, you need to uh, have some plate discipline. So I'm like, all right, I can take some pictures, whatever. <laughs> so there's that umpire strike. Huh. And so then they um, they had to go hire just regular umpires from little leagues, high school leagues, whatever leagues. And, you know, there was turmoil any time of the year with the umpires because a lot of them – um, the speed of the game was different with the balls moving and stuff. And so these guys couldn't see the balls off the bat on the line because they're coming off the bat hot. Balls that are five feet foul and fair. Balls, cutters that are four feet off of the plate. Strikes, some balls right down the middle of the ball. So a lot of guys are getting frustrated because they're trying to get to the big leagues and they got to deal with this. Yeah. And I'm being your number. So I'm up there in Leicester. It was Leicester on the mound that day. 
uh, this is before he got cancer, and he was nasty. He was like 94, 97, late two seam in that, that hook. He didn't have that uh, slider cutter thing or change if he had. And he, the ball is way outside. I'm like, how am I supposed to walk if I take a ball that far off the plate? <laughs> I'm like, they don't get this tape. What's all? This is going to come down as a, a strike. I'm supposed to be walking and stuff, and I can't walk here. And I'm uh, so, you know, get, get the fuck out of my batter's box. I was like, what, huh? He says, get the F out of my batter's box. I'm like, what? I said, what the fuck did I use? You're, 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 you're horse crap. You, you ring me up on something out here. Yo, I said, get the fuck out of here. I'm like, all right. All right. So as I'm going back to the dugout. I was just going to, you know, make a scene, you know, you toss your shit back to the home plate area or you throw your stuff on the field and you tell the, the bat boy don't pick it up just so you can make a scene. So how about that? As I'm walking away and I toss it backwards and I'm going to uh, grab my helmet and toss it back to the home plate. And when I look behind, it just says, Right in her chest, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, just go back to, just go to the clubhouse, man. You go out to this where, whatever happens after this, man." <laughs> did did you? So after you tossed it backwards, you saw it hit him. I was I was, I was wondering if you had to like go see it on camera and be like, "Oh shit!" Uh, no, well, no. Uh, uh, I was walking away and tossed it behind, me and then I was turning to. Uh, uh, spike my helmet so it, it goes in that direction. Uh, and it just hit off his chest, and I was like, Nah, <laughs> just, nah, nah. It, it doesn't uh, it, just, uh, He just walked right into the clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, just, 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 just go. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a hilarious video. I mean, you. You'd feel bad for the umpire because it squares him up, but like the context is important in it. Um, it's one of the all-time videos, I think, because you made your debut like pretty shortly after that, right? I mean, it wasn't too long after that. Yeah, uh, I think that was April, May. Then I got the the uh, they gave me the uh, fifty-game suspension to put it on par with the steroid policy. So then, but the one thing about it, though, there's always something you do that kind of happens out of something. So go down to Tampa. Because Friedman said you're going to do so. So I was a part of that, uh, the wheelchair softball league. You know, doing those charity events when you're doing that with the teams and stuff, you get to meet a lot of cool, interesting people. Uh, a lot of people that have way more enthusiasm about anything. And so it was so much fun uh, going out there with the wheelchair softball league, the Miracle League, uh, doing charity work when I, when I was down with uh, in St. Pete. And then guess who – at that point, was about to get cleared from suspension from Major League Baseball. Who? Josh Hamilton. Uh. So I was down there with Josh Hamilton. We're both on both number one picks with the Rays on suspension at uh, uh, extended. And so Steve Lisley was was like the hitting coordinator and he said, are right, you just going to be uh, in the first group? You guys are always going to be together. So it was my first time meeting Hamilton, you know, uh, uh, the posing six, four, looks like a Greek God statue. doesn't work out that much. Just, just it. And tattoos all over the place. Very soft spoken, really nice guy. Smiling and joking around. And he goes, Hey, I, uh, First round, let's just go uh, all homers um, over the batter's eye. I was like, are you joking? You're not going to lose. And we going to go two over center. And I'm going to go two in the parking lot in left field. And then uh, I'm going to go back over to center. I was like, whatever. First pitch, about 450 over the thing in center. Second pitch, over the thing in center. The next two in the parking lot, I'll go to the back over to the center. Don't ever put me in this guy's DC group again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
some of the most re- – because I heard from Carl Crawford. He said, man, he, whatever you – I wish you could have seen Josh Hamilton play. I wish you could have seen Josh Hamilton play because he always talks about – he almost made the team like his first spring training. There was a, a ball hit in the corner, and he was at the Outland Stadium. He gets it from the wall or like the warning track and throws a ball that doesn't get no higher than nine feet off the ground and no lower than six feet. Just all with a home plate. And so I was I was like, man, this I know it's less than an arm. So I was gonna give him a couple of weeks just to see him throw. And first day after D T he goes, Hey, I haven't thrown in a minute, you know. So don't go that far. I was like, all right, I'll go about forty five feet. First pitch is about ninety six. Almost takes <laughs> off my, my chest. I was like, oh my and then watching him and being around him, I was like, this guy has got some serious talent. Just when he can get on the field, I've got to see this. And then hasn't played above double A and hasn't played organized ball in four or five years. And then in a platoon, not many bats in hit 19 home runs and 300 plate appearances in Cincinnati. Then the next year went off. So it's like, I'm glad I I'm glad everyone got to see that guy. That was something amazing. Yeah, we've we we've been doing something on our on our YouTube where we watch old World Series games just to see some classic moments. And one of them, Josh Hamilton, came up and he hit, you know, a six hundred foot home run in the World Series game. And me and Jimmy kind of had this realization like, man, there's gonna be when when kids are digging through baseball reference or whatever they're doing in 10 years from now, they're going to be like, wait, who was this dude? And, uh, yeah, I mean, just hearing you talk about him, another first-round pick, major league talent, and just some guys are, are just completely different. That's insane. Yeah, some, some, guys, some guys are just oh, – well, everybody's individual uh, – you know, Seven billion people on Earth, and there's only been what twenty five thousand baseball players in the history of Earth. You know, there are a lot of different, a lot of different characters and a lot of different backgrounds. That's why I, I, me and my friends, I always talk about in the minor leagues is where you meet all like the mythological characters of every organization, from guys with insane talent to so this, guys with crazy stories like this and like that. The my the my the minor leagues and baseball, you can you can find some some individuals with some crazy backgrounds that made it to the big leagues and done well. Yeah, I always talk about how baseball that's one of the reasons why I think it's the best sport is like everybody can play it, no matter shape, size, color, background. Input. You can put Randy Johnson, Randy Johnson and Bartolo Colon can share the same mound and do the same <laughs> nasty shit out there. It's crazy. Yeah, it's Stroman. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, you know, and, and then now we're, you know, especially nowadays, it's a very international game. So you're getting people from all over the world and you just, you just don't see that in any other sport. Nah, I'm outside soccer, but they all got their own leagues in their own country. So it's not like it, the big leagues here where it's really mixed. Yeah, but you can't uh, be you can't be players. fat and play soccer though. <laughs> you know, you can't. No, you got to be a stud. Yeah, base, and baseball's a perfect one because I play with some guys, some pitchers that are extremely talented, can run, throw, and everything. Then I play with position players that play the play defense really well. But if you give them a a, a basketball or football, they look like they never they they couldn't play any type of sport in their life. But <laughs> some pitchers can't tie their shoes and they throw a hundred and they have a, a long career. You don't have to be six foot nine like in basketball. You can be five four, five 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 six. You can be taller. You know, you got a range of different heights, weights, and you don't have to be a power hitter. You know, you can be uh, a highly skilled defensive player with a, a great eye at the plate, uh, a, a great great way just to get on base. Like, there's different ways to be a, a successful baseball player. And, and you've been playing in a bunch of different leagues, unless this is wrong. It looks like you've spent some time in Mexican League, Venezuelan, and even Australia. Is there similarities or differences like that you find, like, you know, uh, going from these different countries and playing in these different leagues? Like, how would you compare those three 
compared to minor leagues and all of that? Well, the one thing that's different is in USA Baseball, we don't have any import rules. So you can have a team. You don't have to have each team only can have eight imported players, three imported players and stuff. So you can kind of see where they have really good players. It's just not as many. But it's kind of skewed to say that for Mexico because a lot of those players sign at 16, 17 and come play in the States for a while. And so, but you can just see, like Venezuela, it's it's a winter ball, so it's almost all, every player there is actively still in um, affiliated ball or they're playing independent ball or uh, they're playing in uh, an overseas league somewhere. But the Venezuelans, they, they, they play USA baseball a lot. So everything is kind of just basically like playing USA style baseball. The other, uh, Mexico, they work hard and everything, but they're uh, like mechanical stuff. It's, 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 it's dated, like with the like swings and everything. They're really uh, low line drives and ground balls and BP and stuff. So the games have a lot of hits in them, but not a lot of offense, like not a lot of power. And Australia, you can see that they have guys that can play. They just need to have more guys play games because they have so many other sports down there. But the one thing that you still get everywhere is people love baseball around the world. And it's fun going everywhere, especially Australia, where baseball's not big. And then you bring some people, some of my friends I met down there, brought to a game the first, for the first time. And they're like, I don't know what's going on, but I had so much time. Talking shit to the other team and drinking. I was like, yes. That's all you do that for baseball. Sounds like Australia. Yeah. Like, Canada and Australia, same and thing. I was like, that's all That's all you need to do. I was like, they're like, all right, baseball is fun when you go to it because sitting behind home plate, they're like, the ball moves so much. I don't understand how you guys hit it. <laughs> I don't think but it, I it's fun. It's, it's fun to live in another country and kind of see how people live and uh, be there for two, three months instead of you know, going on vacation for one week and you stay at a hotel, you do the tour stuff. You go on vac- well, I go on vacation. I'm going to do the same thing we do at home. Pool, beach, uh, eat dinner, sightsee, and uh, mix in some drinks while I'm, while I'm at the pool and stuff. But I kind of like going and playing uh, over, overseas for the winter ball and stuff to get a feel um, you know, living in a different country and, you know, just getting out the U.S. for a little bit. I got to be honest. You're like the last guy I would have thought that would end up doing stuff like this. Like you had a successful big league career. Uh, and now it's like, I, you know, we talked about this, I don't know, a while back, but I was kind of asking you about it. And your plan is like, hey, I'm going to come home and uh, work out and hang in the States during the summer and train and then i'm gonna go you know you've been everywhere you and, and australia is the latest place you've been but it's like you're like a world traveling baseball guy now and, and it's fun to see you kind of like transition into that and you're really you're doing it because you just love it and it's really kind of refreshing to to see that yeah and it's fun too for uh the reason i go to australia and yeah. The team I play with, they get guys from uh, the Japanese big league. So two years ago, they had the Seibu Lions guys in there. And our catcher on that team two years ago, last year, won the battle title and MVP in Japan. Uh, Konya was on that team the year before the year before that. And then this year, when I went back, we had uh, a bunch of Oris players. And then they signed Adam Jones to go over there. And then... They're asking me about Adam Jones. Man, I'm just a middle man. I'm like, bro, this is this is kind of a small world. I just I'm coming down here just to help out some of the affiliated guys that are uh, playing. That you know they want to. Uh, got any guy that you know I, I want to. I seen you do this and do that. And so I kind of like uh, just going out and being a like player coach, but with no responsibility of coaching. <laughs> so. <laughs> Dude, you're MLB's uh, ambassador to the world. I love it. It's it's awesome, man. Yeah, and that uh, it's fun. It was cool down there because I don't think they have gotten many guys to go down there that have 
uh, a lot of uh, big league experience until I went down there. And then I saw the year after that, Cole Meter was down there. And then last year, there was quite a few guys with five years plus down there playing. Everyone loves it because you you play four games on the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, doubleheader Saturday, or Thursday through Sunday. And you get the Monday until your game day uh, off. It's op- optional practice. And so it's very optional for me on vacation mode. <laughs> and then you get to play the game. It's not taxing on your body. You're in Australia during the summer. I was in one of the best cities in the world in Melbourne down there. So, it's almost it, it, like I, I need the airports to uh, make sure uh, they open up. So I can try to go to Venezuela for the first month and play down there and then try to go back to Australia after Christmas and uh, have a summer vacation and play baseball down there. That oh, sounds like the absolute best life ever. <laughs> yeah, tre- tre- Trevor says he knows you and he's a little surprised by it, but, but that's literally my dream. You're getting paid vacations <laughs> to play baseball around the world. Yeah, and the he, only he's way single it happened, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that with a wife and kids. I wouldn't be able just to leave and have been like, "Hey, honey, you can't come down here. You need a visa." <laughs> like that. That wouldn't be able to fly, but uh. I think uh, I was I didn't I wasn't I didn't take a little ball for uh, a while I didn't do anything I was just sitting at the house in Miami doing Miami things uh, and I got a call from Virgil Vasquez he's from my brother we trained known each other since uh, beginning of high school and then we trained together at P3 in Santa Barbara and he gave me a call going hey I'm a pitching coach down here in Melbourne they need a hitter would you like to come you just got to be able to come for four months. And then he, <clears throat> I said, bro, you don't got to sell me to come to Australia for four months. On a, like, I'm coming, bro. <laughs> so that was the only way. And then down in Australia, I got a, a call from the team in Mexico. Would you want to come? I was like, well, might as well. Let me they go just see found Mexico. You. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and so then um, uh, I forgot so, someone – Someone called me a baseball mercenary. So basically just <laughs> – so you got a winter ball team in a cool city, call, call, them. call me. <laughs> yeah, I might come. <laughs> Love it. Love it. I, uh, I, last, last question just on skateboard. And, like, do you still have a skateboard in the garage? Do you still shred? <laughs> Is it, like, do you look on Amazon, like, every couple weeks and you're like, maybe I got to get one? Where, where's your skateboarding career at? Uh, uh, when I saw it, I stopped skating just because of car employed, blah, blah, blah. And so I would just go buy a deck once every two years just so I tag and look at it and stuff, but then I'll give it to my nephews and <laughs> stuff like that. So I don't know where all of them are at, and I just found my BMX bike in the, uh, in the, the shed. And, but, I love it. But uh, I, I would like to just be able to get, get, get back on it and just, just cruise around. You know, to say I'm trying to get some vitamin D outside of their shirt on and trying to burn some calories. So I guess I'm doing fitness stuff. But I would like mm-hmm. to get back on it just to roll around, just to reminisce of what it was like growing up in Canada, California. We'll, we'll let you go, but I do, I do have one more nugget I, I looked in that I wanted to ask you about. I was looking at that, that Baltimore pinch hit double, which I think the city of Baltimore loves you forever for that one. And it was the first pitch, like 70-mile-per-hour curveball that you were swinging on, which kind of surprised me that uh, that was first pitch curve. But you love the first pitch. Yes, I was going to say. I know, that, no, no, I, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, it, it, your numbers on the first pitch are 350 batting average, uh, and uh, you you swung at a lot of first pitches. So is that something from twelve year old Delman through? Just I- I'm here to hit. Well, to be honest with you, I better lead off till like high school. <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it wasn't it wasn't till uh, it was I think it was like low A when. 
I so I went to the Arizona Fall League. I went to I find late, so I went to an extended for two weeks, and Tampa had a real short one, so they kind of wanted me to be active. So they just sent me down to Arizona Fall League to be uh, on the taxi squad, just to be maybe play once a week, twice a week that they let me, just to be active. And I I'm down there, and all the guys, you know, they're so hard, they're nasty, and stuff, but they're they're right around the plate, so you know, I got good hand-eye coordination. Uh, I can make contact and then just play, you know, all for the best. So when I get to low A, I did it. So it's good. It's all 97, but he's hitting the backstop. And I'm like, oh, batter's box is flung with some of these wild guys. Like, look. <laughs> I don't know how I even got to the season with how wild some of those pitches are. So I was always just trying the first pitch that is up, out over the plate that you think you can pitch some serious wood. I want to go ahead because the last thing you want is to get hit in the fingers or anywhere where you're going to miss time because you some time in minor leagues or missing time to get to the big leagues. So Love that answer. I was just trying to stay uh, injury-free and not get hit by any pitches. And, so, and then it just kind of, well, kind of just started just happening and a lot of pitches were just throw balls over the plate. And two, I found out you can't strike out in the first pitch. So, <laughs> I, I let it eat. Love it. It's great. Cool. All right, man. I think uh, I think we'll let you go. Trev's got Trev's running off to do his his new show. We got. Uh, I'm sure you got a lot of fun stuff planned. Hopefully, quarantine's going well for you. And get to get you to uh, Australia soon or Venezuela? Was it? Both, but when Both. the sun when the sun's fully out, I'm I'm just gonna go hang out and get some uh, get some sun. So I got nothing to do till Sunday, Sunday night, really, when the Jordan, the Jordan documentary comes back. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's everyone's calendar right now. I love it. See you there. All right. Well, thank you, man. We really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, chatting with us. That was awesome. All right. No problem. Do it again sometime. Yeah. All right, man. That's thank good. you, Dale. All right. Take care. And there he was, living the uh, baseball mercenary lifestyle, just four months in Australia. You know, what do you say? Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and sometimes Thursdays are just do whatever you want. And then you can play baseball on the weekends. I mean, come on, Trev. Like, that is literally like a teenager's lifestyle. He, he loves it. I mean, he, he's, he doesn't have to do it. You know, like he said, he was in Miami doing some Miami shit for a while. But he is just a baseball player. I mean, that's from, he, you know, 11, 12 years old until he debuted. He was – the golden child on every publication he was top ranked he had all that pressure minor league player of the year he said right minor league player of the year like he's had all the pressure on him that anyone could ever have you know had a good big league career and then took some time off and now he's like you know what i have a talent i get to go travel to these places he goes and plays in venezuela for a month which they love him in venezuela then he goes and plays in australia for a few months like you said i think a lot of people would sign up for that lifestyle yeah, I mean, it's a uh, vacation in baseball. It's literally like uh, a dream for me. And yeah, I mean, some some things that stuck out when he was like, yeah, you know, I don't love skateboarding more than baseball. I think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just as you said, like a guy that became number one prospect and everything. Like, I, I don't know. I think if he could have got some offers to shred, it sounds like that was in it. And then, dude, at the end, I mean, talking about his approach at the plate, like I'm imagining how many coaches that would drive insane. But at the same time, like, hey, uh, just give me some more of the plate I could get the bat on. I'm not trying to get hurt in here or anything. Like, that's amazing. He yeah. hates getting hit. Like, that is one thing. <laughs> he hates getting hit with the, with the ball. And I think I've told a story on Talking Baseball about the time when Jose Mahares did something and then they beat Delman. And instead of being mad at the pitcher, he started going after Jose Mahares, his teammate. Right. Like, this is your fault. Like, he hated getting hit. So – it was funny to, for me to hear that, like, I, I'm swinging the first pitch because I'm trying to get the hell out of the box with these guys that don't know where the ball is going. Yeah. It's also funny, like, you know, the media, he even said, yeah, the media, like, people think I'm from, like, you know, uh, the, the bad parts of L.A. or I grew up hard. He's like, I had, I had bleach blonde hair, love skateboarding and punk rock. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm from Malibu. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's a fun one, man. And uh, I think, like, he's a guy, like, he just – He's just such a good personality. And like, I, I've said this a million times now, but like, if you know him, you love him. 
it had to be comforting for you, Trev, to have like your debut at bat and you got Delman Young ahead of you who you had sleepovers with when you were 12. It was awesome. And like I said, he was like a big brother to me. He's only like six months older than me, but he was just developed quicker and was in the big leagues before me. And yeah, so to have him and he always had my back. You know, you go into a big league clubhouse for the first time, whether it be spring training or regular season, it's a daunting task. You're scared, dude. But to have a guy that like, yeah, I grew up with. And he's like supporting me. And like, I had it really easy because one, Delman was there and had my back. And two, he taught me how to fucking act, dude. Like I knew how to act because of him. So I owe a lot um, to my baseball career for, uh, to Delman. Cool. All right. Trev's going to go do a, a brand new episode of Sequence. Uh, you got a fun guest he's recording with. So make sure you are checking those out every Tuesday and Thursday on the John Boy Media YouTube page. And uh, thanks for listening. We appreciate it. We will see you on Monday. Have a good one.